It's good to see everybody. I see lots of familiar faces, and thank you for being here. I see some new friends, too. It's good to see you as well. And uh, we're going to be talking a bit about how to move from text to sermon when preaching the parables uh, today. Uh, those of you who I've had in class um, have uh, walked through Ephesians or maybe Romans or teaching a class on 2 Corinthians right now, and um, you know that it's a somewhat different task to preach on Paul's letters than it is to preach on narrative in the Gospels. And so I thought it might be helpful to think through how you preach narrative. And so we're going to be doing that for the next few minutes, and I hope it'll be helpful to you. Um, most of you who've had me in class also know that I'm a real advocate of what I call expository preaching. Now, that's uh, preaching discipline that uh, people define in different ways and they practice in different ways, but let me explain what I mean by expository preaching. I think expository preaching is the clear explanation of a biblical passage that moves through the passage's line of thought following the author's own logical order, illustrating its meaning where necessary, and applying it in practical ways to the lives of those who hear the sermon. So in other words, expository preaching is just explaining the text as it sits on the page, illustrating it, and applying it. To preach expositorily, I hope, at least when I do it, I hope when you do it, is always to preach the Word of God. So there is a sense in which we are taken out of the way and the Word of God moves from the Scriptures themselves to the congregation. My goal is always to have people not really thinking about me or who I am or my performance, but to be thinking about God and what the scriptures teach them about God. So we're going to talk in the next few minutes about how to do that with parables. And I'd like to divide our comments, our thoughts, our thinking together into two parts. First of all, how do you study for a sermon on a parable? How do you actually prepare the sermon? And then secondly, how do you preach the sermon itself once you're prepared? So just two simple steps. We're going to be using the parable of the wicked tenants in Luke chapter 20, verses 9 to 19, is our example of how to do this. So if you've got a Bible and want to go ahead and turn to Luke 20, 9 to 19, we'll get to that in a few minutes. All right, first of all, let's think about how you study for a sermon on a parable. The first thing to do is to interpret the parable within its own gospel context. So parables need to be preached not within some theoretical setting within the life of the historical Jesus. In other words, they don't, should not, I think, be preached plucked out of their gospel context not as detached, free-floating units to which we give some interpretation other than the interpretation provided by the gospel in which the parable occurs. That's not what we should be doing. But we should be preaching parables as they occur in the course of our regular expository preaching on one of the gospels. That's the best way to preach the parables. Rather than doing a sermon series on the parables of Jesus, in which we pluck parables uh, from the Gospels, we ought to be preaching through Mark, and as we hit a parable, we're gonna uh, address the preaching of that parable in a special way, because parables uh, present us with some special challenges for preparing and preaching sermons. So the most important step in uh, preaching a parable is to preach it within its own original context. And uh, I think there are really three steps we need to take as we prepare to preach that parable. 
The first is that we need to carefully read the parable itself. So as we prepare a sermon on the parable, we need to zero in on that parable and read it preferably in Greek, which is a way of slowing us way, way down in our reading of the parable so that we're just taking it word by word, phrase by phrase, as we work through it. And then the second step needs to be to carefully read that same parable again, but this time within the context of the several paragraphs on either side of the parable, so that we're reading it within its somewhat larger context in the gospel. And then third and finally, and this is probably the hardest and most time-consuming task in preparing for a good sermon on a parable, is that we need to read the entire gospel in which the parable is located from beginning to end. And uh, to read it with what we've discovered about the parable from our careful study of it in mind. Now, at first, this might seem really time-consuming. It might seem like, wow, I'm going to have to read slowly, taking maybe an entire afternoon, read slowly through, say, Matthew or through Luke or through uh, Mark in order to preach on this one small couple of paragraphs. It actually can go a lot quicker than that. Depending on how well we know the gospel, how familiar we are with the scriptures, how many times we've read the gospel in the past, Reading through it with our particular parable and its concerns in mind should be a fairly quick process. It doesn't need to take a really long time because you don't have to read quite as carefully as you would be reading the gospel if you were preparing a massive study, for example, on the gospel itself. You can read it relatively quickly because you're looking for the things that are in the gospel that link up with the theme or themes in the parable. And it actually doesn't take that long at all. Well, let's look at an example of how you'd go through these three steps of preparing for a sermon on a parable with the parable of the wicked tenant. So if you don't have your Bible open there, now's the time to turn to Luke chapter 20. We're going to be looking at verses 9 through 18. So, Matthew, Mark, Luke, chapter 20, and uh, verses 9 to 18. Let me just read it for us to get it before us. It's a familiar parable. You probably already know it. And he began to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard and let it out to tenants and went into another country for a long while. When the time came, he sent a servant to the tenants so that they would give him some of the fruit of the vineyard, but the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed, and he sent another servant, but they also beat and treated him shamefully and sent him away empty-handed. And he sent yet a third, this one they wounded and cast out. Then the owner of the vineyard said, what shall I do? I will send my beloved son, perhaps they will respect him. But when the tenants saw him, they said to themselves, this is the heir, let us kill him, so that the inheritance may be ours. And they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and destroy those tenants and give the vineyard to others. When they heard this, they said, surely not. But he looked directly at them and said, What then is this that is written? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces, and when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. So the first thing we want to do in preparing for a sermon on this parable is to read the parable itself, just like we've done, but to read it very slowly, preferably in Greek, and to pay careful attention to the main point of the parable, the main point that it's trying to teach, any links that the parable has to the Old Testament, and any links that the parable um, uh, any symbolism that the parable has that may not be 
directly anchored in the Old Testament, but is fairly obvious symbolism from what we know both of the Old Testament and the teaching of Jesus. So as you read this parable, it's pretty obvious that the main point of it is that those who fail to respond to the messengers of God, and especially to God's Son, God's final and ultimate messenger, those who fail to respond to the messengers of God will eventually fall under the judgment of God. The main point is not complicated, it's relatively straightforward, and if people uh, who hear us preach on this parable don't go away with anything else, they need to go away with a clear grasp of that point, because that was the point that Jesus was trying to teach. There's a lot more significance to this parable, but it's very important that that point gets across to people. Well, as we read the parable carefully, we also see several points of contact with the Old Testament. We know our Old Testaments well, as Jesus' original audience did, it will only take us a minute to realize that the vineyard in the parable is a symbol for God's people. Because in Isaiah chapter 5, an account of a vineyard is described or told that's very similar to this parable. It's not exact, but it's very close, and the echoes of Isaiah 5 are pretty clear. There, uh, somebody plants a vineyard, the vineyard doesn't bear fruit, and the vineyard owner destroys the vineyard because it doesn't bear fruit. And right at the end of that little section of Isaiah 5, Isaiah says very clearly, the vineyard is the people of God. This is Israel, God's people. So when we come to this parable, it's really obvious that the vineyard here is a reference to the people of God. The people of God in Jesus' day was Israel. It was beginning to be the church. The people of God today is the church. So this parable has a very direct application to the church. It's also pretty clear from that Old Testament background who the vineyard owner is. The vineyard owner in Isaiah 5 was God, and the vineyard owner here is God as well. It's a little bit surprising that in this parable we have an element that's not in Isaiah 5. In Isaiah 5, we've just got the unfruitful vineyard and God and God's judgment. Here we have the, uh, the vineyard and God the vineyard owner, but we have tenants. Now there's a difference between a vineyard that is owned by a vineyard owner and tenant, the tenants of the vineyard. The vineyard always belongs to God. God's people are always his people. Tenants can be changed. And so that's something that we need to pay careful attention to when we look at the parable. It's a little bit of a surprise and whenever we see a surprise in a parable of Jesus, that's worth sitting up and taking notice of because there's probably going to be some meaning in that surprise. It's also pretty clear from this parable, if we know a little bit about the teaching of Jesus and the Old Testament, that the messengers in this parable are the prophets, John the Baptist, and then, of course, Jesus himself. And the real giveaway that the messengers are God's messengers, like the prophets and John the Baptist, is that the final and ultimate messenger is Jesus. So when we think about, well, who in Scripture is like Jesus and the fact that they bring messages from God, it's very clearly the prophets. Uh, John the Baptist, we could say in this period of time, the apostles are messengers of God. They're, the repository of their witness is contained in the scriptures, these are God's messengers. And then, of course, the parable ends with judgment. What's the judgment? Well, in Isaiah, in, in the book of Isaiah, the judgment is Assyrian dominance in the seventh century over God's people Israel. And then later, in the book of Isaiah, it's the destruction of Jerusalem in the sixth century B.C. And we only have to know a little bit about uh, the history of Judaism in the first century AD to know that not long after Jesus told this parable, Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans. 
So the judgment here seems to be something that happens in the Old Testament, and probably it's going to be looking toward this in the New Testament. It's something in which Jerusalem is involved. Jerusalem is destroyed. There are two surprises in this parable also. When you read it carefully, just on a first reading as you're going through it, you see two major surprises. We've already seen one minor surprise, the fact that there are tenants here. But there are two major surprises in this parable. One is the incredible persistence of the vineyard owner in sending messenger after messenger after messenger, and then finally sending his own son. We sort of cringe a little bit, don't we, when he sends his own son. We wince and think, no, don't do that. Things are not going to go well. These obtuse tenants who've rejected the messengers are surely going to do something horrible to the son, and our expectations are verified. What's surprising here is that the vineyard owner is so incredibly persistent. He's got to be as smart as we are. He's got to know that when he sends the son, something bad's going to happen to the son. That's a surprise in this parable. That's odd. It stands out. It's unusual. The other surprise in this parable that we need to take careful note of is the incredibly hard-hearted response of the tenant. Uh, we're just aghast at the fact that they are tenants who are working on this vineyard owner's land, but they absolutely refuse to give him rent. We might understand them doing that once. Maybe there's been some misunderstanding, but to do it again and again, and then to very bizarrely think that if they kill the son of the vineyard owner, somehow the inheritance will be theirs. What is the problem with these tenants? So there is another surprise in the parable, just the shocking craziness of the tenants. Why are they acting this way? So the vineyard owner acts in an unusual way that's surprising. The vineyard tenants act in a very unusual way that's surprising. So we've got, once we've read through the parable, we've sort of got a profile of the main point of the parable, the surprises in the parable, and we've got something of the Old Testament background there. At this point, then, we need to read around the parable. It's that, what we've just done probably is going to take the longest amount of time in preparing a sermon on this parable. And now we need to do something. It won't take quite as long, but it's very important. We need to read around this parable in the Gospels, and I, in the Gospel itself. So, I would back up into chapter 19 and just see what's going on. What prompted Jesus to uh, utter a parable like this? And you can see back in 19, chapter 19, Jesus is in the last week of his life. He's, the triumphal entry has happened. Uh, in verses 41 to 44 of chapter 19, he has wept over Jerusalem because Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. Well, now for my careful study of the parable itself, that's really interesting because we know that God's judgment on his people, especially his people's leaders, have, has often involved the destruction of Jerusalem. And that's exactly what Jesus is thinking about in verses 41 to 44. And then in verses 45 to 48, Jesus goes into the temple and he does something uh, amazing. He, uh, he, he um, begins to drive out those who sold in the temple and he says to them, my house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. And we ought to recognize that as a quotation from Jeremiah chapter 7, which has to do with the temple of God and God's people thinking that the temple's existence would protect them against God's judgment. And yet God's people are not obeying God and they're oppressing. These are the leaders of God's people who are oppressing uh, the other members of God's people. And so Jesus says, uh, uh, my house shall be house of, of prayer, but you have made it a, a den of robbers. And then that leads his authority to be challenged by the people that control the temple. You can see in verse 47, the chief priests and the scribes and the principal men of the people were seeking to destroy him. 
They were seeking to destroy him because they knew full well what his action in the temple meant. It was an anticipation of the destruction of the temple that would come because like the people in Isaiah's time, like the leaders in Isaiah's time, like the leaders in Jeremiah's time, they were oppressing and abusing God's people by the way they ran the affairs of the temple. God was going to come in judgment and destroy that temple. That was not a welcome message to them. So they sought to destroy him. And then in chapter 20, they challenged Jesus' authority in 21 through 8. They want to know where he gets this authority. And Jesus does not give them a direct answer, but the parable itself, the parable we're going to preach on, the parable of the wicked tenants, answers their question. He doesn't give them a direct answer right away, but he answers their question in the parable. The other thing we notice, if we read carefully around the context, is that the scribes and the chief priests are in the audience of this parable. You, you don't see that real clearly until verse 19. And so um, this is the point at which in preaching on the parable, you know, it's maybe Tuesday or Wednesday in the week before we preach on Sunday, we've got to get the bulletin ready. Um, we might want to include verse 19 in our scripture passage on this parable. The scribes and the chief priests sought to lay hands on him at that very hour, for they perceived that he had told this parable against them, but they feared the people. We now begin to get a really good sense for who the tenants of the vineyard are in the parable. They are the chief priests, the scribes, the elders, the leaders of the people. They've been oppressing God's people by the unjust, unfair economic practices that they have used to enrich themselves in this big business that was the temple, but to do so at the expense of the poor and needy. That's why Jesus calls the temple a den of robbers. And so they are the tenants who needed very badly to hear the message of the parable, but we discover in verse 19 didn't hear that message at all. So a second reading of the parable within the general context of the parable itself will really help us understand what Jesus was doing when he told this parable. We now can begin to formulate some applications. This is a parable really that at the first level is spoken to the leaders of God's people. This is a parable that is very, very pertinent to all Christians, but particularly a pertin pertinent to pastors, elders, deacons, Sunday school teachers, teachers in Christian schools, teachers in some spiritual authority over others, um, because that's who Jesus' audience was. Okay, now we need to do a third reading of the parable. This is the reading where we think about the parable in light of Luke's gospel. What's Luke doing in his gospel? What does he want to bring out by including this parable? There's a lot more that Luke could have included in his gospel that he didn't. Uh, there, he included what he did include for a particular reason and for particular reasons that we believe the Holy Spirit inspired him to uh, think about. Why did he include this parable in his gospel? So as we read through Luke's gospel, we discover that very early on in chapter 9, toward the end of chapter 9, Jesus launches out on a journey. And this is a journey to Jerusalem. So from very early on in the narrative, in Luke chapter 9, Jesus leaves Galilee and he's on his way to Jerusalem. And every now and again, Luke plugs in a little phrase like, and as he was on his way. As he was getting near to Jerusalem, just to remind us that all this teaching Jesus is giving here, he's giving it in transit to Jerusalem. Who's he giving it to? Well, he's giving it to the disciples. He's giving it to the people that are around him. And as we make our way through all that teaching on the way to Jerusalem, we discover that one of the primary themes that Jesus is interested in is the theme of what wealth can do to us. The theme of how a desire for wealth and comfort and prestige 
can make us hard-hearted to the things of God. Turns out to be a major theme of that teaching. So it's no accident, for example, that along the way to Jerusalem, Jesus teaches the parable of the, uh, uh, of the man who built barns and bigger barns and had no idea what to do with his wealth but took no thought for God and no thought for the poor who were all around him. And God says to him, you fool, this night your soul shall be required of you. That's only in Luke's gospel. Or when we get to chapter 19, only in Luke's gospel do we read about Zacchaeus, the tax collector, who realized as he came to Jesus that he had a problem, and the problem had to do with wealth, and so he does everything he can as a fruit of that Uh, conversion to following Jesus to make right the wrongs that he's done by greedily seeking other people's wealth. And so he stands up and says, I give fourfold uh, what I took, what I extorted from people, and I I give half of my belongings uh, to the poor. So we learned that wealth, what it can do to us, make us hard-hearted, is a real important theme in Luke. We also learn Uh, that what happens when we repent and turn, and people can repent and turn, people as hard-hearted and greedy as Zacchaeus can repent and turn, Uh, when that happens, then that revolutionizes our approach to wealth. That, I think, should give us a whole new way of looking at Jesus' cleansing of the temple when we're reading Luke's gospel. Because what Luke wanted to bring out here was that this temple cleansing, for, and it probably had other purposes as well that the other Gospels may well bring out, but in Luke's Gospel, this temple cleansing is largely about how the greed of the chief priests, the scribes, and uh, the elders of the people, how their greed had made them hard-hearted toward the things of God. So this parable is, to a large extent, a parable about how wealth can blind us to the messengers of God. All right, well, we've spent a long time talking about how you prepare for a sermon. Let's be very quick as we talk now about how to preach a sermon on this parable. How would you do that? I would begin by reminding people of where we are in Luke's gospel. When standing up to preach, I might begin with a short illustration of how leaders can create disaster for their people by neglecting a warning to change their behavior. Some little illustration to that effect might be good. Or you might just want to dive right in to an overview, a brief overview of this parable's context so people understand what I've just explained. So I would ask people to open their Bibles, and I would walk them through a few key places in Luke where Jesus teaches about wealth on his long journey to Jerusalem. You don't need to read all of the uh, story of Zacchaeus. People know that story so well, all you need to do is remind them of it and remind them that it only shows up in Luke's gospel. And then I would talk a little bit about the importance of the setting of this parable in Jesus' life, that its setting uh, takes place as Jesus was thinking about the destruction of Jerusalem in the last week of his life, and the setting of the parable comes after he cleanses the temple and calls it a den of robbers. So I would, I would spend a few minutes, maybe just five minutes, laying that background out for people. And then I would take people through the parable in three steps and in the order that these steps occur in the parable itself. I would start, first of all, with verses 9 to 13. That would be my first step. And I would focus in on the surprise that is there in verses 9 to 13, the surprise of the mercy of the vineyard owner. It is uh, surprising that the vineyard owner is so merciful. He acts from what a worldly business perspective is in a crazy way. He does that because this vineyard owner is none other than God himself, who is merciful and loving, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. And so when we don't pay him his rent when it's due, he doesn't immediately hammer down on us in judgment. He sends another messenger, and another messenger, and another messenger, 
and he loves us so much that eventually he sends his own dear son, and it's no mystery what's going to happen to his own dear son when he sends him. He knows full well that his own dear son is going to die. He dies on our behalf. Why does the vineyard owner act in such a surprising way? Because God is such a merciful and gracious and loving and kind God. This is where I would plug in a key application to uh, make sure people understand the nature of God. Um, People are very confused in our day and age about God, who he is, what he does. Um, And one of the pieces of really good news we can give them is that God is a gracious God. So I would plug in an application here about the nature of God that God is gracious, maybe an illustration, too. Then I'd move to the second point of the parable, the second part and second point of the parable. And it comes in verses 14 to 15, and it has to do with the hard-heartedness of the tenants. It's equally surprising that the tenants are so unresponsive to God's mercy. This, of course, teaches us something about the human tendency to spiritual blindness, to rebellion against God, our absolute obtuseness when it comes to our own sin. We're so ready, able, and willing to find the sin in other people. And we are so ready, able, and willing to give ourselves a pass, to offer all kinds of excuses about why, even though we did exactly the same thing that we think is sinful in another person, We're not really. It wasn't sin for us, uh, y'all. It was something else. Um, And that's hard-heartedness against the messengers of God, against God sending his messengers to us in the form of those who bring his word to us or his word itself. (coughs) Excuse me. And that hard-heartedness is very dangerous. It leads to judgment. This parable is a parable of warning, and that brings us to the third step in preaching the parable. I want to go right next, following the order of the parable, right down to the theme of judgment. I would talk a little bit about how judgment came on Israel in the 7th century, judgment came on Israel in the 6th century, and judgment is about to come on Jerusalem in A.D. 66 to 70, and finally in A.D. 70, when the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans. And Jesus says here in this parable that happened because the leadership of the temple refused to listen to the messengers of God. I think it'd be helpful to do a little exercise here of just imagining with people as we preach toward the end of our sermon, preaching on this parable, a little imaginary exercise of what if they had repented? How would things have been different? How would Christian history have been different if they had repented? Well, the Romans would have still crucified Jesus. He still needed to die for our sin, and their wickedness was more than ample to that task. But the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders wouldn't have been involved. Maybe the temple would have ended up being the center of Christian mission uh, outward to the world. And the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders, along with the apostles and followers of Jesus, would have organized a worldwide mission to the whole earth. It's not that God's purposes aren't going to be accomplished when we refuse to obey and we hard-heartedly turn God's messengers away. No, he'll accomplish them. We just won't have the blessing of being involved in in being in on that wonderful mission. And so I'd want to make that point to people, and I would also want to make and be very careful to make this point because I think in many ways it's the main point of the parable, that it is really important for us to listen when God gives us the rare and merciful gift of a messenger who tells us that we are sinning. I don't know about you, I don't like it much when people tell me I'm sinning or when I receive criticism, my defenses go up. And it may be that sometimes that's done in the wrong way. But even when people do it in the wrong way, it's really important for us to think first 
before our defenses go up and before we think how inappropriate it was for them to say that to us or whatever it might be, it's important for us, first of all, to wonder if this is God being gracious to us and pointing out something that we need to pay careful attention to. Now, that can also happen when we read God's word. It can happen in a number of other different ways as well. But I'd want to be sure people go away with that message because I think that's the main point of this parable. When God speaks, especially when he speaks a word of correction, we need to listen because a day of judgment is coming. And on that day, we want to be found to be within God's purposes and cooperating with him in what he's doing and not on the other side of God's purposes. I'd sprinkle this sermon with a healthy dose of illustrations, lots of practical application. I'd try not to keep it real heady and academic, you know. That's always a temptation for me to get into the history of the first century and all this stuff. I'd, you know, try to avoid that if that's your tendency too because we want this to be practical and applicable and clearly understandable. We don't want to alienate people from the scriptures. We want them to feel like, you know, I actually probably, if I had studied as hard as the pastor had studied this week, I probably could have come to that same conclusion that, uh, that he came to. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Thielman. Sure. Uh, yeah. I'm just curious when you're, um, especially with the immediate uh, context of the parable, if we're under the assumption we're preaching a series through Luke, mm -hmm. say when you're when you're preaching the triumphal entry and Jesus weeping over Jerusalem and cleansing the temple, how much would you key the congregation into elements that are the point of the parable, or would you save the parable sermon to kind of like remember mm -hmm. when we talked about this? Like mm -hmm. now we see this more fully. I'm yeah, just curious your thoughts on that. That's a really good question, and I need to be careful not to speak beyond my own experience because uh, I'm not a pastor. I don't teach, preach regularly. You know, I'm not preaching through Luke's gospel uh, for this semester. So I've I, I got to be careful that I'm not speaking beyond my experience. But just to answer your question with my sort of lack of experience and knowledge, I would say repetition is the mother of learning. And it's not going to hurt to bring the points up where they occur in the text, in the process of preaching expositionally. When you hit them again, you, you just repeat them. You might want to have a little bit different, slightly different application or illustration, but, uh, but just hit them again. We also have to remember we live in a very transient age when people are constantly traveling, especially on the weekend. And so we can't really assume that people have heard the whole series. You know, we, we probably do need to begin, as we preach, kind of filling people in on what's happened the last couple of weeks. So it's a great question. Thanks, Ethan. Yana? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Thelman. Um, when it comes to parables, how do we, how do you kind of determine what details of the parable are just kind of filling in? Mm -hmm. the parable Great itself question. and what details kind of carry over and have yeah. symbolic kind of meaning. That's a really good question because we've all been warned at one time or another against allegorizing the parables, you know, like Augustine did with the parable of the Good Samaritan, and we've probably all heard its allegorization of it. And that's quite correct. We can't assign a meaning to every single element in the parable. Um, but they're usually indicators within the broader context of what elements of the parable do have, uh, do have some symbolic meaning. And some parables are uh, allegorical. Uh, Jesus did tell a few allegorical parables. Um, and some parables have more than one point. But the broader context will bring that out. Often when they're heavily allegorical, Jesus will interpret the allegory as he does with the parable of the sower. And we need to follow his interpretation. Uh, the other thing to be aware of as we go through parables, and this does happen in parables where Jesus doesn't interpret the symbolism, the broader context, you might or might not find the uh, symbolism interpreted there, but in-depth knowledge of the Old Testament will make it clear that there are certain images in parables that Jesus could just assume and the gospel writers could just assume were readily identifiable 
uh, by people. So the fig tree, for example, is one of these. The vineyard uh, is another. Uh, the messengers are another. So the Old Testament background, the broader literary context of the gospel, and then, of course, Jesus' own interpretation of the parable, I think, all offer good good guidelines to not over-interpreting. It is best to under rather than over-interpret the parables. If you've got to make a mistake one way or the other, I would make the mistake of just giving the main point. Uh, because we also can uh, fill a sermon with so many points and details that it just confuses people. They go away without a clear understanding of what, you know, what the main thing was. So, great question. Thank you. Yes, sure. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think you can do that. I think what Jesus was saying in this parable was fairly socially radical. And uh, that's one reason it got him into trouble. And I think we live in a society that needs some uh, social correction from the pulpit. And so I, and I think where that's clearly taught in the Bible, where we clearly have oppression going on in our society, especially when the church is complicit in that oppression, uh, the word of Jesus comes powerfully into that. So yeah, I think, you know, that's exactly right. It's a good observation. Appreciate it. Um, Dr. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Our friends Jerry McDermott and Tom Wright interpret this uh, parable differently for what it says about Israel. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not going to make you give a statement on that right now. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> would you stray away from dialoguing with that at all from the pulpit? Or do you think that that's something that would be important for us to talk about mm -hmm. whether or not we take a side? Um, do we need to bring up the issue bring of that. Mm -hmm. the people of Israel? And yeah, good question. And I, I don't know. I haven't read Tom Wright or uh, Jerry on this, so I don't know, you know what, what they say about this particular parable. But um, I would say it's probably important from the pulpit to uh, keep heavy theological debates and discussion out of the sermon. I, th I think that um, unnecessarily probably presents roadblocks uh, to people. Now, that's not to say we don't need to know about those things. We certainly do, and we need to form our theology and have a depth of theology out of which we preach, but uh, I think I would avoid it in a sermon. It might be more, much more appropriate for a Sunday school class. Uh, you know, that would be the place maybe to bring up some of those uh, deeper scholarly debates and issues. Good question. I'd like to give, just selfishly, five more minutes for questions and discussion. Sure. Yeah. But if you have class, I'm going to pause so you can go to class. You may or may not know, but I am the academic dean. So <laughs> if you're not in class, <laughs> then I'll find out. No, I'm kidding. See you later. Thanks Glad for you could coming. Come. Okay. Bye-bye. I'll have a good afternoon. And while I have the mic, Frank, I'm going to ask one. Um, within the parable, part of the kind of the climax of the first surprise is the son mm -hmm. who's sent and killed. So I think because something that's just very lively as we're learning preaching, as we're learning the scriptures and seminary and doctrine is we would say, man, I need to preach the crucifixion here. Mm -hmm. So how much attention would you mm -hmm. give to the crucifixion? Have, if you're in the context of a series on Luke, as, you're, as you described, you're mm -hmm. preaching through the Gospel of Luke. Yeah, good question. Um, because uh, especially since Luke does not focus on the crucifixion quite as fully as uh, Matthew, John, and Mark do, I mean, it's important to him. It's not like he disagreed with the other gospel writers or anything like that. The crucifixion is important to Luke. But uh, he was introducing some other themes that were also very important, and those are the things he emphasized. 
However, and this is one of the places actually where I think it would be a good place to go to see, oh, well, Luke actually does absolutely embrace the importance of the death of Jesus for God's people. It is very clear in this parable that uh, the son dies um, as a result of the hard-heartedness of the people. And um, so I think bringing that in, it would be appropriate. Um, it would kind of depend on how long you had to preach. You know, in a 20-minute sermon, it might not be uh, the best use of time to dwell on that uh, because it's not the main point of the parable, I think. But um, in a 40-minute sermon, it would be good to briefly present why Jesus died on the cross. And... Um, to even, I mean, it's so interesting if you move into the book of Acts, these very people to whom Jesus told this parable, the chief priests, Annas, Caiaphas, the apostles are still preaching to them, hoping they're going to repent. So uh, it's a very good indicator that God does not give up on people, even after they killed the son. Uh, thankfully, in God's mercy, the judgment hadn't come yet. <laughs> So they still had room to repent. So what a great opportunity to engage in some evangelism from the pulpit for anybody in the congregation that might not be a believer. And maybe just taking two or three minutes to do that uh, would be a really good thing. Totally related to the parable, and when you hit it in the parable, just make that application. So good, good point. Yeah. Once again, thank you, Dr. Thielman. Yeah. How long should... Uh, a pastor spend time by like week by week through a book like let's say Isaiah and you go even mm. chapter by chapter you're, it's going to take more than a year to get through the right. whole book yeah um, or even going in Luke parable by parable you're going to spend a lot of time mm -hmm. in one book yeah and so you're not really giving your congregation the whole counsel of God so how long should you how long should you dwell yeah that's a really good question and again i'm not the best person to answer probably nick back there is you know the best person in the room to answer this question because uh he's a working pastor who's an expositional preacher and works hard to preach through god's word i think it's a challenge isn't it nick to you know preach through isaiah what would you do <laughs> yeah. Right. Right, yeah. Great idea, yeah. Excellent, thank you so much. Um, Dr. Thielman, yeah. one of the things you mentioned uh, in terms of pre preparing and then also moving to the table is the role of illustrations and illustrating the main truth of the text. So after you've honed mm -hmm. in on what the passage is really about, then you want to illustrate that truth. And I was just wondering if you mm -hmm. could share some wisdom with us yeah. with how you evaluate the benefit of illustrations. Good you've all question. heard four illustrations. Yeah, thank you for that. That's a really good question. Um, I think in preaching the parables in particular, you can cut way back on illustrations because the, you know, the purpose of an illustration is to engage the imagination in the direction of the text, to illuminate the text. So we never want to tell an illustration that gets people's eyes off the Bible so that people going out the door make a comment on the illustration, but they don't really know what the sermon was about or what the text was about. We want to avoid that. And you can tell very powerful illustrations that are so powerful that they overwhelm people's memory of the text. And that's 
probably not a good idea. That's especially not a good idea with parables, which are themselves interesting, engaging stories. So I think we can preach on the parables without a lot of illustrations, typically. We may want to give a modern analogy. When I preached on uh, the parable of the wicked tenants at Altadena Valley Presbyterian Church this summer, which is where this is coming from, um, I did use an illustration at one point to illustrate the, uh, the economic lock that the chief priests had on the temple. Uh, and I just, I didn't go into a lot of background there. I might have gone into too much, actually. But I wanted to illustrate why Jesus was so upset that they were ripping people off in the temple and that it had become a den of robbers. So I illustrated that by saying when you went to the temple from Galilee, you couldn't carry a dove or a lamb with you. You had to buy your sacrifice at the temple, and the prices were inflated. It's just like going behind the security barrier at the Birmingham airport where, you know, on one side you pay one price for a hamburger. On the other side, you pay a highly inflated price. So I use that little illustration to sort of bring that home, although honestly that probably didn't even need illustrating because it's such a common principle, economic principle. So that's the kind of little brief illustration you can sometimes use to sort of bring us from the first century into the 21st century and help people understand what's going on in a parable. But the parables themselves are so exciting and engaging, they just kind of grasp people's attention. It's almost our job to get out of the way of the parable and let it, let it have its impact, uh, let it communicate to people. Application is the hard thing. You know, that's what we need to be real careful, I think, and think very hard about, especially when we preach the parables. So thanks. Great question. Uh, I was noticing at the beginning of this text uh, the man going into another country for a long while and the, the same language being in the parable of the prodigal son. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if, yeah. if there is an er like interparability or, or something like that. There, there is, you get that concern in Luke's gospel in particular to stress that uh, the owners in these parables go away for a long time. And what Luke is stressing there is the um, possibility that it could be a while before judgment comes. It could be a while before Jesus' parousia. And that's something you pick up on again when you read Luke from beginning to end. You, you have, uh, you, you can kind of see, okay, that's what Luke's trying to communicate to me here, that this judgment may not be tomorrow, and that's really good news. There's time. There's time to repent. I think that's what Luke was trying to say. So good, good question. Thank you. Let's thank Dr. Thielman again. Oh, thank you for coming. Yeah.